pobres del mundo, en pie los esclavos sin pan. here at this uh, at the Marxist groups uh, paying attention it's also interesting that they're paying so much attention to this question of the rise of polemics in Syriza uh, it's a moment of uh, of some considerable optimism uh, on the left uh, in Europe for the first time in quite a while so I think it's interesting as well that the Marxists are are, are as uh, on 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 the ball on this thing so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the, the politics of austerity and their relationship uh, to the rise of polemics in Syriza and uh, and uh, theorize a little bit, to talk about what I think uh, different, different contributions from Marxist theory in particular uh, ha have for helping us understand uh, the situation, the conjuncture uh, in the south of Europe and Europe more generally, as well as, uh, as well as the possibilities, the opportunities that arise on the political horizon, but also uh, uh, to learn from many of the difficulties of the past and to have a kind of critical realism with respect to the limits uh, and, uh, and challenges of the populist uh, strategy and of representative democracy. So, uh, 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 so a lot on the table, and I also want to make some comparisons between what I think are the strengths of Syriza versus the challenges. Uh, more, cha I think that the situation for Podemos to come to power uh, is a bit more challenging for a variety of reasons which you can talk about. So uh, first point I want to make is that to understand uh, the current conjuncture in the south of Europe, uh, I, I think we do need to understand it in, in the entire regional uh, as, a, as a part of a European phenomenon uh, linked, into the, linked into the financial crisis and particularly the political response to that financial crisis, which has been austerity politics. Austerity politics, uh, uh, which in Spain, this comes from 2012, for example, uh, talk, uh, the, the first year uh, Rajoy came in with a, with a new budget, the Pepe, uh, a 20% cut to welfare, uh, sales, a, higher sales, a new higher sales tax, new tax on lottery winnings, fresh round of layoffs among employees of government agencies and government-supported enterprises, the obliteration of, of, of public support uh, to the arts, uh, 27 billion euros uh, cut from the, from the state budget in 2012, one of the toughest austerity drives in modern Spain, a Spanish history, and this, is, and this has continued, and I think this is something that has happened. The Spaniards did it uh, uh, on their own, self-imposed the austerity, whereas the Greeks uh, uh, had it imposed upon them. Uh, but uh, the, the politics of austerity, uh, 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 it, 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 this is not the first time in, in Spanish history, uh, in recent Spanish history, that Spanish workers have been, uh, uh, have been uh, confronted with politics, of, uh, 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 politics demanding difficult sacrifices. Uh, from the time of the 1970s, with the crisis that, 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 that uh, accompanied uh, the transition to democracy, there was, when the Socialist Party came into power, the Socialist Party, party came into power and reenacted very, very, uh, 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 very uh, hard, uh, uh, difficult uh, 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 yeah, things that hurt with respect to structural adjustment, a neoliberal-style structural adjustment. But they did it at the same time that they were expanding the welfare state, expanding social rights, expanding education and the like. And uh, you saw throughout the course of the 1980s, in fact, that Spain had structurally very high levels of unemployment uh, in the 20% uh, like they do now. But, it, but again, this was at a time at which uh, the welfare state social rights that were, that were uh, uh, conceived of as consubstantial with the democratic transition and why the democratic transition was, was, was uh, viewed by the vast majority of the Spanish population as a successful thing. <laughs> Uh, by contrast, the, the austerity that's been in place since the uh, outbreak of the crisis in Spain, and it's important to, to note that in Spain, unlike in Greece, where you can debate about the, uh, about the role of, uh, of uh, a public deficit in the, the initial uh, parts of the crisis, in Spain this was clearly, clearly a story about, uh, about, uh, uh, a fi the, about the, 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 the bubble in the, in, in the housing market, and it's about private debt private debt that becomes sovereign, uh, sovereign debt uh, because of the policies that are uh, put in place to, to respond to it, so to speak. And so this set of policies then has, has pushed for, has, has pushed for uh, 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 very difficult uh, sets of structural adjustments, so, so to speak, as well as cuts, at the same time, cuts uh, in, in the welfare state. So high levels of unemployment. So the material bases of consent, so to speak, have been pulled from underneath the hegemony of the 1978 uh, uh, constitutional order, what, what they call, uh, people are beginning to, to refer to the second Bourbonic restoration even uh, in and around uh, uh, Podemos. And I, so, so this is indicative of what I would say uh, that the politics of austerity, like what Wolfgang Streeck has talked about, how the politics of austerity have, have, have created a crisis for representative democracy. And this is happening 
between, uh, a, a crisis that we can understand as an organic crisis. And, and the rise of Podemos and the rise of Syriza are to be understood as a result of this organic crisis to the democratic representative institutions. So an organic crisis, what is an organic crisis? We go to Gramsci. Uh, Gramsci says, at a certain point in their history, social groups separate themselves from their traditional parties. The men who constitute, represent, and lead the, the, the parties are no longer recognized as true expressions of their class or subclass. And you see that very clearly in the case of Greece with the complete uh, destruction of PASOK uh, in uh, uh, its electoral fortunes and, the, and also the, the, the considerable difficulties of the, uh, of the, of the Socialist Party uh, in, in, in uh, Spain, uh, particularly, particularly considerable difficulties because of the complicity, in fact, uh, 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 in fact uh, uh, the protagonism of the Socialist Party uh, 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 in, uh, in, in pushing forward the austerity agenda, uh, most, uh, most clearly, uh, most clearly uh, represented by uh, this uh, express reform of the Constitution, Article 135 of the Constitution, to get what the Tea Party in the United States would be their wet dream, which is uh, uh, pushing the idea that there can be no, uh, no deficit. Uh, no deficit. So, uh, so with these organic crises, the organic crises lead to opportunities. Uh, so, and with this opportunity then, uh, this is where uh, Podemos uh, uh, comes onto the scene in Spain. Now, uh, Podemos comes onto the scene, uh, and it's very interesting to put this in a comparative, uh, a broader comparative European perspective, because one, one of the things that we see in response to the, uh, uh, in, in response to the austerity agenda, particularly post, uh, post 2008, is a, a, a flourishing of all kinds of populisms throughout Europe. Uh, but in the north of Europe, what you see is a right-wing kind of uh, xenophobic anti-European populism, whereas in the south, what you see is a, 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 is a populism that, that, that tilts to the left. And they have different diagnoses of what is a similar kind of predicament. And so this is something that's interesting to think about, the relationship between the right-wing populism uh, that, that, is, uh, that is secessionist vis-a-vis -vis the European Union and anti-European and anti-immigration uh, on the one hand, uh, being in some kind of dialectical uh, relationship to the rise of the left-wing populism uh, in the South. So we can think of at the Europolity level it being a, a territorialization of a kind of class struggle, a dialectical class struggle. We'll get to that because uh, the working class is, is largely uh, absent from this, from, from, uh, from this dynamic. But anyhow, it's important to understand that part of the success of Podemos and Syriza has to do with the discursive repertoire uh, that they employ. They're, it's a discursive success in part uh, in terms of understanding, uh, 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 understanding being able to, to, to uh, communicate communicate a message that, uh, uh, that explains for Spaniards what is going wrong and, how to, and, ha and, and being ambiguous but, but, but offering, uh, uh, offering a, a, a diagnosis and a prescription uh, for the cures. And that cure has to do with the discourse of the political caste. Okay? And this is a discourse that has a, a, a long political history, not always a noble political history, but it's a discourse which we can, it has been theorized as a populist uh, form of discourse as well. And uh, so for an example, an example coming from Pablo Iglesias in, in July of 2014, this is an interview in The Guardian, how he's selling himself, uh, uh, and, and I think it's, it's quite uh, uh, indicative. He says, in some ways, uh, it's their institutions that are in crisis, a monarchy that's more and more identical identified with impunity and corruption, so it's about corruption, huh? and the established political class, the uh, uh, caste of the regime, the established political caste of the regime. The goal of Podemos was to turn the social majority into the political majority, said Iglesias, by having ordinary citizens do politics. Quote, if people don't do politics, others will do it for you, and when others do it for you, they can steal your rights, your democracy, and your wallet. So it's a denunciation of corruption, and impunity of a political caste in particular. So it's a corrupt, it's a diagnosis of corruption. In the first instance, therefore, it's not a systemic critique. It's a critique about the corruption of the system. Uh, but, and then it goes along with a, a discourse about democratic participation and empowerment as, uh, as a, a way of, of, of fending off being stolen. So this, is a, this, is a, this has been a powerful uh, a discursive, a, a discursive repertoire, and it's managed to uh, uh, symbolize and become the incarnation of so many vague aspirations associated with the Quince MA movement. Uh, let me just uh, contrast this discourse with the discourse of populism that is very, po that is very powerful and I think uh, uh, looking at what's been happening uh, in France since uh, the Hebdo affair I think is likely to become even more successful uh, discursively, uh, which is Le Pen's discourse. So Le Pen is also interestingly uh, a critic of austerity. Uh, 
In fact, austerity is more directly, uh, in, in this quote at least, although uh, P Pablo Iglesias clearly has a critique of austerity as well, but, 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 but clearly austerity is uh, in Le Pen's discourse as well, at least as directly. The more austerity one imposes, she says, the more growth suffers, the lower tax revenues remain, and the higher the budget deficit. Plus, the, government's ha the government has saved by marking cuts to useful expenditures instead of to, to the damaging expenditures. Savings should be made with cuts to the generous social system. With grants, illegal immigrants, the same, which grants illegal immigrants the same protections as it does our citizens. So then she turns it uh, 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 against this, the generous social system, particularly generous against migrants. And with welfare fraud, and with, and with the EU contributions, which rise every year. So there's a similar kind of uh, a critique that gets pulled in a very different political direction. But there's a, a, a similar kind of populist appeal, nonetheless. Um, and now... Let me turn to think about the, the particular difficulties with respect to the populist, uh, uh, with, with respect to a populist electoral appeal in the Spanish context in particular. So, in the Spanish context in particular, uh, you have uh, you have emerging out of the uh, out of the period of austerity politics, you have the the the, the eruption onto the international uh, 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 mediated scene of this popular quasi spontaneous movement, which is the Quince M A uh, uh, movement, the Indignado movement. Uh, this Indignado movement had strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and I think pr particularly the strongest of its weaknesses is a weakness that Podemos still has in a particular, uh, uh, in a particular which has to do with the low levels of, of mobilization and participation of the people who are on the bottom uh, of the system. So one of the things about the discourse, this, the, the, this Quince kind of discourse about the 1% versus the 99% is it tends to be protagonized by people who are right around the 20th percent, so to speak. So, but nevertheless, and, and one of the things that, 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 part of the diagnosis of the Quince AMA movement was that, the, was that the, the mobilizational capacity was impressive, but there was no understanding of how you capture power and how you would change the political, uh, the political dynamic. So it was understood as a move into the political arena. But there are dangers with respect to, uh, with, with respect to a politics that are mobilized around the, the political arena, uh, 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 most specifically, dangers that have long been pointed out by uh, Marxist theoreticians. So Marxist theoreticians like Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, who talked about elections being a trap for fools. So according to Sartre, for example, to vote or not to vote is all the same. To abstain is an effect to confirm the new majority, whatever it may be. Whatever we may do about it, we will have done nothing if we do not fight at the same time. And that means starting today against the system of indirect democracy, which deliberately reduces us to powerlessness. We must try, each according to his own resources, to organize the vast anti-hierarchic movement which fights institutions everywhere. And so this kind of Sartian line, in fact, was very, uh, uh, resonated quite, quite strongly across many of the activist elements in the Quince M.A. And one of the things that Podemos has done uh, 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 through its eruption onto the media scene in Spain is it has organized into a quite hierarchically, vertically organized political organization uh, that has moved away, uh, that, that, is, that is clearly moving towards a, a logic of winning as much vote in the electoral arena as possible and moved away from the task of popular mobilization understood along the lines of the Quince AMA movement. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, 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 a debatable point, but there are certainly people who argue that along those sorts of lines, and there's clear Marxist, uh, uh, there's clear Marxist legacy for arguing along those ways. Having to do as well, I'm going to have to think about this, because this gets to this question of, uh, of, of Podemos as a mediated phenomenon, and Pablo Iglesias, thinking of, of Pablo Iglesias as s simultaneously the incarnation of popular aspirations, but also a media phenomenon. Uh, so five to seven minutes, cool. Um, and this is linked into the question of what it is to be a candidate, and a candidate to the presidency of the nation, so to speak. And, uh, and I think all, all the way going back to Perry Anderson, for example, talking about this question of what happens in this, uh, in, at the moment of the election, symbolically what the election is. I think it's worth uh, uh, keeping in mind and, and having this on the, uh, on the agenda for a, a broader discussion amongst people friendly to Marxism. So uh, uh, Perry Anderson says, uh, back in the 1970s, the bourgeois state, by definition, represents the totality of the population, abstracted from its distribution into social classes as individuals and equal citizens. In other words, it presents to men and women their unequal positions in civil society as if they were equal in the state. Parliament, elected every four or five years as the sovereign expression of popular will, reflects the fictive unity of the nation back to the masses as if it were their own self-government. 
The economic divisions within the citizenry are masked by the juridical parity between exploiters and exploited, and with them the complete separation and non-participation of the masses in the work of parliament. So the parliamentary move, there's a long tradition of thinking about this being linked to a uh, depoliticization, a departicipation of the working class. And in fact, what we have, uh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll end on this note, and we can talk about, uh, about a lot of other things in questions in, 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 the, in the broader discussion, uh, has to do with the limits, the limits uh, uh, with respect to the politicization of the working class. Because uh, let's be clear about this. Even though it is, it, there, there's, all kinds of, there's all kinds of messages on the horizon, uh, Barack Obama speaking uh, uh, just yesterday in favor, uh, in, in favor of, uh, of Sidisa's anti-austerity uh, uh, message, uh, the, ban- the, the governor of the Bank of England as well coming out. So there's intrafractional disputes about whether or not a kind of neo-Keynesian uh, a, a stimulus pack- package might be a better way to go than austerity. Uh, 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 nevertheless, in terms of the, the promise of collective of emancipation, which so much hope is pushed into these projects, the fact is uh, 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 you're going to need a lot more mobilization of, of the working class. And the question of the fragmentation and the depoliticization of the working class and the question of how to get a will to, uh, to active political struggle amongst, in particular, the working class is something that Podemos has, uh, uh, has as, as, as does Teresa, as a major challenge before it. And uh, again, to end on this, on this point, because, because Pablo Iglesias and uh, the people surrounding him, well, they've been brilliant in terms of, in terms of access to the ma- mass media and pushing forward a discursive agenda a discursive reframing of how to understand the situation in Spain, but this is to set up for a struggle. And then if there's going to be a struggle, we have to expect that there was going to be a response. And in that response, then we have to be able to think tactically what are the policies that we're going to implement in case, uh, uh, in case the Troika uh, d- decides to attack. And this is something that is a debate that's going on uh, uh, in Syriza so right now. And I, and, 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 and I wonder uh, whether, whether, uh, uh, whether the, 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 the Podemos... Uh, the people lead, leading Podemos are going to have the level of, 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 of uh, political class, so to speak, uh, that, that, that seems to be in Syriza. Having, having to, 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 let me finish on that point with respect to the differences between Syriza, uh, Syriza and, and Podemos. First thing, having to, uh, first thing that we have to understand with the particular challenge in Spain uh, is, uh, is the fact that the, the Socialist Party is not disappearing. The Socialist Party is not disappearing, and so what this means is, in the last, in the, in, in the last uh, uh, surveys, for example, they actually came ahead of Podemos, one or two percentage points. And so right now, Podemos is polling somewhere between, uh, between uh, 20, uh, some, some polls will give them the first, but w- with less than a third of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the popular vote, but others have given them d- down to third, and the Socialists basically have just as much of strength. And so most of where Podemos has grown electorally has been through a, a kind of uh, 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 eating a lot of the socialist electorate, also eating off of the communist electorate. What you have is a divided, uh, a divided left, effectively, a divided le- left in an electoral system that uh, very much uh, uh, punishes uh, uh, a disunity on the left, and you have a united, a relatively united, uh, uh, united right. Uh, and so this is going to be a very difficult situation for Podemos in terms of governing. Imagine if over one minister uh, there, there was as much difficulty in, in, in Greece. Uh, and, and a last point, and on this point I will end, uh, a, a big difference between, between Greece and Spain is that Greece has, and you see this personified in the, uh, in the uh, electoral pact, uh, with this nationalist right-wing pa- parter, party, there's a there's there's a, a diffused Greek nationalism that is a, that is a unifying force uniting uh, this populist this populist front, so to speak. Whereas in Spain, the national question is uh, uh, is notoriously divisive. Divisive, uh, uh, divisive amongst workers in particular, and one of the uh, one of the real electoral strengths that the right uh, uh, that the right uh, that the right in Spain feeds off of, but so too do the Catalan nationalists who are equally neoliberal, uh, 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 feeding off a kind of smokescreen around identity nationalist politics that divides and keeps workers alienated from the political process. And so I think, uh, the, in particular, if we think about the the, uh, uh, the difficulties of the populist strategy and thinking through the populist strategy, well, nationalism. Uh, a unifying, unitary nationalism, in, in a certain respect, uh, is, uh, is one of the strengths uh, of, of Syriza. It also is one of the big dangers of, of, of the Greek scenario because, uh, because you have uh, Golden Dawn as the third, uh, the third party. So with that, I think, we've, uh, uh, I think I've said uh, uh, plenty uh, for discussion. So, thanks. All right.
Um, uh, so, the way I would like first to start is by saying the following. Friends and comrades, we won in Greece. <laughs> and it's a, a victory which I think the European left has been waiting for long now, all these years. And it's something that the victory of Syriza, I think, is the first step and also uh, for the European left, but it's also um, a fulfillment for all the struggles that the, that the left across Europe uh, has been facing all the recent years. Um, so, um, what I will try to do uh, is I will try to describe a bit the recent events in Greece and try to, ex to describe a bit the history and what happens in the last recent days in Greece. And I'll try to codify a bit, uh, a few points also which I think they are critical on, I think, how do you formate the 2000, uh, sorry, to the 21st century uh, left solution to the global capitalism, or some points at least for that. So, um, how did the whole thing start? So, as you know, in the last um, six, uh, five years, we have been under uh, the um, under the IMF and the European Union, uh, under a strong austerity agenda that has been pushed by these forces. Uh, and uh, basically, what happened is, after all these uh, years, um, we have been refraining from paying back some money. We have been, we currently have uh, to pay back. 170% uh, of our GDP in depth back to the Europe, to a trust that they have built it between the IMF and the European Union. Uh, and this year is the first year that after um, a memorandum of funding of the Greek economy, uh, we were going to have to pay the first interest back to the, to the lenders. So <coughs> what happened is at some point in December, um, we were running out of money. The government, uh, which was being formed by the Social Democrat Party and New Democracy, uh, they realized that they don't have the money to pay 15 billion euros the next year that was, that was supposed to be the, the interest that we had to pay as a country. And so what they did is they tried to negotiate again with the European Union to find a new solution of funding again back the debt with more debt. So um, what happened is they started the discussions, and basically the European Union was pushing for a harder austerity agenda. Um, informations were leaked about this agenda, which they were suggesting that the European Union was pushing to increase uh, the minimum age of retirement. They were pushing on cutting back more uh, wages in the public sector, of cutting jobs in the public sector. It was a full-fledged austerity attack to the Greek working class, basically. Uh, so, at that point, the coalition government realized that they don't have the, the power anymore to support something like that. They knew that if they were going for something like that, what, they, what would happen was that it would be a social uprise, and they, had, they wouldn't stand a chance against it. So, the choice that they made at that point, the strategic choice, was um, they used... Um, in, in 2015, Greece was expected to elect a new uh, president of the country. Uh, for that, they needed to have a majority vote of 180 MPs uh, from the 300 in total that there are in the parliament. Uh, they only had, I think, 165. And what they did is they pushed the button and they started this process. Now, if they didn't manage to get 180 MPs, they would have to go to elections. Uh, and so they basically forced the, the state to go into an election process. In parallel, what they did also is they um, set a date in February, which was um, basically what they were doing is they were extending a bit the funding that was given to the country. And after that point, we would either go bankrupt or we had to negotiate for a new memorandum in order to get more money and push a new austerity agenda. So um, the presidential election didn't came through. And as a result, we went to elections. Now, what the, the two major parties had created was an atmosphere of basically you vote for us or we go bankrupt and we don't have anything. Um, and the, 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 the country goes into a bad state, we don't have any more food, no imports, no nothing. And this is an agenda that was being pushed over and over through the media, uh, through advertisement. The politicians themselves, they were promoting strongly this agenda with very bad comments like people were saying, you know, uh, if Syriza doesn't win, if Syriza wins in the next elections, we're just withdrawing our money because there is no future in Greece, creating a, um, an amazing environment of fear. Interestingly now, this whole process, after all these years of austerity, didn't demotivate people to vote for the left. In contrast, what it created 
uh, was basically uh, a, pub a public perception, which was also maybe uh, majoral in the, uh, in the society, which, which was basically, you know what? We had enough of this austerity. Let's try for something different. Uh, and that something different came through as the, the agenda that Syriza was promoting all these years. And at that point, the losses of the working class were so big that people didn't even uh, felt the fear of we're losing everything. So as a result, this whole process uh, came against the two major parties. And as a result, in the elections that they happened last Sunday, uh, Syriza came first. And it came first with a big victory. We, uh, basically, Syriza got 37%, which is his historical high. And also, it was 10% uh, more than the second party, which was the New Democracy. Um, unfortunately, this didn't give the majority in the new parliament. Uh, Syriza only has currently 149 MPs uh, in the new parliament, but it gives him the opportunity to form, and he formed a coalition government. Uh, interestingly now, from the results, uh, the traditional parties that they were supporting the memorandum, they didn't manage to get... Uh, like PASOK and the Social Democrats, they were completely obliterated. They split in half, and only one of the Social Democrat Party went into Parliament. Um, a, par a, a party that was created, Potami, which was like a, a liberal uh, center-right, center-left party uh, that was formed basically uh, from the oligarchs of Greece, didn't get, got only 6%. And New Democracy um, lost only 2%, but still it was... Um, way behind Syriza in the polls, and you would expect that if there was a swing vote from the Social Democrats, that would go to New Democracy, but instead it went to Syriza. Uh, so we managed to get the majority, and it was a big victory. It was a big victory because um, it, it basically um, it built the hope for the whole of Europe. Uh, during the day of the elections, uh, there were um, people coming from all around Europe to support uh, the Greeks, uh, the, the, the Syriza members. Uh, if you search around for videos, you would see people from Italy, people from, uh, from England, uh, people from Spain. Uh, Pablo Iglesias was there the day before the elections. Uh, that they were um, so happy about this change. And it seems also that this victory of Syriza uh, created a lot of optimism across Europe. Now, <clears throat> um, so the elections came out. We didn't win the majority. It was a very horrific night where we were uh, waiting until 2 o'clock in the morning to see what the outcome would be and if we would get like 151 or 150 or 149. It was a very tight um, loss of the, of the majority vote. Um, so the next morning, um, we had to form a government, basically. So what would happen is that once you get first into the elections, you get uh, the command from the uh, presidential, the president of Greece to formulate a government. Uh, the first thing that Tsipras tried, and it's something which is debatable, but I can also discuss why this thing happened, was to form the coalition government with the independent Greeks. Uh, this is a party which is center-right, but with a lot of patriotism inside. Nonetheless, it's a party which has a clear agenda against austerity and against the memorandums and against um, uh, the, the, the European um, establishment that tries to formulate um, an austerity agenda across Europe. Um, I would say that um, this was a, an imposed uh, choice to, to make this government with independent Greeks because there was no other alternatives. The Communist Party was really firm uh, that they wouldn't even collaborate. They just expressed that right straight after the results of the elections. Uh, and it's a very strong Stalinist, old-style Stalinist party. And then the other choices were either formulate a government with the, the parties of the past, uh, like New Democracy and the Social Democrats, which was not an option. And also there was Potami, but that's like a formulation which basically was like forming a government with the oligarchs of Greece, which had no point. And also the other option is we could go for another election in, December, in uh, February, but that would create a massive issue because there was a discussion to be made about the Greek debt at the end of February, and this would change a lot the, the public perception and the, the agenda. So Tsipras decided to, to go for this coalition. 
Um, interestingly, the first thing that Tsipras did in order to formulate like this historical um, connection with the past is once he got um, inaugurated as a prime minister of Greece, he went to, um, there is a historical monument in Greece, in Kesariani, which is basically a place where the Nazi Germans in the 40s, they shot 200 uh, Greek left uh, partisans. And the first thing he did is he just went there to provide his salute and his support and possibly the moral um, justification of his whole uh, movement that happened in the 40s and continue uh, struggling to, to, to get um, the, uh, thank you, um, to, 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 to manage to, to make uh, this change in Greece. So now, the, interesting, the second interesting thing is the following. Um, it's amazingly, like in the case of Syriza, how the historical time can be so dense and changes can come up so fast. Um, I would say that right now Syriza has, I think, the, the, the agenda that he's pushing has four major points. The first one is, um, it's more a strategic point, which is once you have somebody, uh, when, once you're confronting somebody who's more powerful than you, you don't go head on but you try to find ways to attack him that would make him uh, weaker. The second thing is what Lenin was saying, which is um, once uh, you have the power in the, in the social structure, what you're trying to do, uh, you're trying to find ways to create cracks in the, in the existing system and try to make them wider, and you try to make the, the collaborations you need in order to achieve that, in order to hit the, the enemy. Um, then a, a third element of the, of the Greek, uh, of the strategy of Syriza at this point uh, is basically comes from Althusser, which says, you know, um, the revolution is not something that, will, it's an instantaneous thing that will happen. We won't go just uh, to the winter palace and we will attack. But it's an ongoing dialectical process where you will have small wins, you will have small victories, but you will always have to struggle for that and it will never end. And the fourth element is that uh, it comes a bit more from Lacau and the Gramscian uh, approach, which is if you want to win something, you need to have the, the hegemony in the social structure. Otherwise, you won't be able to go forward with anything. So interestingly, these whole things created a nice agenda which has been put forward at this point. Uh, and, you know, Syriza doesn't go for a full-blown socialist program transforming the economy. It's going for a mild Keynesian model that will create the, the right elements to create the democratic uh, transformation of the Greek society and then slowly propagate more radical changes in the economical system. So the changes that basically Syriza put forward, they're very simple. First of all, you provide health to all unemployed. Secondly, um, you try to formulate a new solution for the debt, which is completely uh, tied to how much your economy develops and doesn't put any burden for further development. The third thing is that you create uh, all these small bills that they will allow you to revoke a number of important changes of, of the austerity program of, in, imposed by the austerity program just to create like this victory uh, spirit among people and a lot of the movements that they have been forming this uh, solution forward uh, they were basically so just in the first day that their movement was being justified by what Syriza, the changes that Syriza put forward. Like, for example, hiring back the people of the public sector who were laid off, or also uh, revoking the, um, I think it's mobilization, what it's called here in England, where basically the state says, you know, whatever happens, you cannot strike, you just have to go to work. And all these little things, like removing also barriers from the parliament. And this whole thing created an amazing environment across Greece. People now are, for the first time after five years, being so optimist. And people are ready also to go further into this struggle and try to win more. And also try to uh, formulate and try to, to find together with Syriza a, so, a new solution for the, for the problems that currently Greece is facing. And it's a very interesting time for the left. Uh, and the other interesting thing is also this, and this is my closing remark, it's interesting also to see how the victory of Syriza has changed the whole discussion uh, across Europe. First of all, the Social Democrats right now across Europe, they seem to making a change in their opinion, and they're starting to discuss also solutions 
uh, about how you fight austerity. For example, Hollande uh, this Saturday uh, had a visit by uh, Tsipras, the, the prime minister, and they started saying, you know, like, maybe what you're discussing is something interesting, something that didn't happen in the past when Syriza was promoting these ideas. Um, secondly, you see this change also in the social the democrats of Germany, who are also now trying to put a bit of pressure on Merkel on rediscussing a bit the austerity agenda. And the interesting thing also, the second interesting thing, is how this has a very big impact on the European left which you see like Podemos uh, coming, um, being very motivated by this change, but also you see things that they happen, for example, in, um, uh, in Slovenia, for example, where you have the United Left there, which is out of nowhere within a year, is getting 17%. Uh, similarly, you see like the Linke getting a lot of interest from the workers in Germany who, were, who are trying to see things differently and trying to see how we can all fight together the austerity agenda. So, what I think is interesting in the, Syriza, in the case of Syriza is, you know, changing all these things is not, it has a very bad and very difficult struggle to get there, but definitely also even small things can change a lot the, the whole public spirit, and it's very, it, it's, it's interesting when you get the power also, how easy it is also to change things, and also when you have the hegemony of the social movement, uh, that people, when they are lining behind you, how easy it is to open discussions and try to make democratic changes, and how to make uh, a whole change of the system. And I think that's something which is critical, it's important for the whole European left movement. So... That's right. First of all, I'd like to congratulate our, our Greek comrades for their great uh, victory. Uh, it really, really has been uh, amazing news coming from Greece lately. Um, I would like to say that um, that the situation we are seeing now in uh, in Europe, but in particularly in particular in Southern Europe, is uh, <clears throat> is really I would say uh, revolutionary. I think what one would have to go to back to the to the 1970s to see such a level of enthusiasm, <clears throat> of, uh, of 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 political awakening of ordinary people of, of ordinary people really uh, uh, trying to uh, seize their future into their own hands, and it's extraordinarily inspiring and. Uh, and really, uh, I mean, the, the epoch we live in is full of uh, challenges and difficulties, but at the same time, I, I would like to say that it is a, it is a, a, real, uh, it's a real honor and, and a privilege to be uh, young and be a revolutionary in the times we are, we are living through. Um, and um, the, the developments we've seen are, are really revolutionary. Think about this. A party created in, in February 2014 by a small group of, uh, of left-wing academics in the University of Madrid Created in February, not that many people know about it. The guy, Pablo Iglesias, is quite well known because he's always on TV uh, talking about attacking the, the right-wingers and, and saying some very radical stuff. This party, by May uh, 2014, gets 8% uh, in the elections. A party that was created out of nowhere. And immediately after that, we see extraordinary, develop, extraordinary developments. We see uh, that the party in the polls just uh, shoots up to uh, 24, 25, 28% and overtakes uh, all the other parties uh, in a matter of, of a few months. Uh, not only that, not only are people saying that they will vote for the party, uh, and, and this is reflected in the polls, but also they are actually getting involved in, the, in, in Podemos. We see uh, circles, which are the small uh, local groups. Uh, we have a few here. There's one in Cambridge, there's one in Oxford, where I come from, springing up everywhere, thousands of people getting uh, involved. Uh, the, the membership of the party just shooting up. I think at the moment they have almost uh, 300,000 uh, members. It's not very hard to become a member, uh, this has to be said, but uh, it, it means a lot. <laughs> um, we see that uh, they had the, their, their foundational congress in September, I think, in, in Vista Alegre, in Madrid. 8,000 people there for a party that had been created just a few months ago. So the level of enthusiasm and, and popular uh, uh, involvement is, is really extraordinary. And I would say that uh, this is a, a revolutionary or a pre-revolutionary situation, uh, and it really has uh, scared the, the ruling classes. They are they really uh, they really panicking, and they launched a very vicious campaign against uh, Podemos. 
uh, Lenin gave uh, three uh, preconditions for what is a, a, a pre-revolutionary situation. And he said uh, that there is the, the first condition is uh, uh, confusion and fear among the upper classes and division. We've definitely got that in Spain. You just have to read the, the papers, even amongst uh, the European upper classes. You read the Financial Times uh, and they're really, uh, really scared. I will, actually, I've got a quote here that they will read from an article in the FT in the Financial Times, which is the mouthpiece of the European capitalists which uh, says, Sad sadly for the nation, Podemos is not a reformist group, nor a disorganized, fe festive, progressive collective in the image of Italy's five-star movement, but a revolutionary party, tightly led by a compact cadre of tough, smart, pragmatic intellectuals in the best or worst of the Leninist tradition, hardened through their, wor through their uh, worth as advisors of Chu Hugo Chavez, Evo Morales, and other Latin American socialists. This is, what, this is how the European upper classes are, are, are looking at Podemos, they're really scared. So, confusion and division amongst the upper classes. Um, a sharp turn to the left by the, broad, uh, by the broad layers of society, by the majority of society, not only in the working class, but also in the middle classes. And we see this as well with, uh, with millions of people voting for Podemos and, and getting involved in the, in the party. And third, uh, not only a turn to the left uh, on, a, on a level of, uh, of ideology and consciousness, but, but active participation by the people in the class struggle and in the movement, taking to the streets, participating in politics. And we see those three preconditions in Spain, and we saw them in, in Greece, obviously. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so this is the, the situation we're, we're in now. What is the perspective? Well, I think Podemos is going to uh, win uh, a general election fairly soon. I cannot tell you exactly when, but it's <laughs> fairly obvious that they will. Now, uh, Thomas rightly mentioned that the PSOE is still fairly strong and that the left is divided. Yes, but think about what will happen in the next few months. We have uh, municipal elections coming up in May. There are, there are uh, regional elections in Andalusia in March. Now, uh, Podemos, which is going into, regional co into local coalitions with other left-wing parties, like the United Left, uh, they're usually called the, the Ganemos platform. Ganemos means uh, we will win, uh, which is, uh, I think they, they will. I think it's uh, quite a good name. Um, <laughs> so they, 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 they they will probably come first in many towns, in many cities, in these municipal elections. Um, or they might, uh, they might come second in a few, but it, it looks like in, in, a, in a few key cities they will come first. And now, well, they will come first amongst the left, sorry. They will probably come second because the PP is going to get more votes than, the, than Podemos. That is because the left will be divided, the PSOE and the... And the, uh, the PSOE and, the, and, and Podemos. They will probably come second after the PP. So what will happen then? The PSOE will, will be put in a very, very difficult situation. They will, they will basically uh, either have to decide whether to support local Podemos governments or to support local PP governments, because they will have the swing vote. Now, uh, it don't, and this only needs to happen in a few cities. It doesn't need to happen all over the place. But as, as long as it happens in, a, in, in Barcelona, Madrid, Valencia, Málaga, Sevilla. Um, and what, what, what will the PSOE do then? I mean. Either they can uh, decide to, uh, to support local Podemos governments, and, but this will really, uh, this will, first of all, this will lead to, to split within the party because the, there is a powerful right-wing sector led by people like Bono or Felipe González who, 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 who hate the idea of going into an alliance with the PSOE and there will be splits, there will be chaos, there will be decomposition and people will see, well, the PSOE means nothing, they, they came second, they are supporting Podemos, so we will go for, for Podemos. Uh, but the second possibility they have is supporting the, the right wing, supporting the PP in the municipal governments. And this will completely destroy uh, the PSOE. If they start doing that, even if, again, even if it's just in a few cities, it will completely destroy their, their legitimacy and their popular support. And they will collapse. It will become a, a PASOK. Um, uh, I mean, and even, you know, the, the PSOE and the PP, well, you might have the possibility that they might win a majority between the two of them uh, in, the, in the general elections in November. But even then, if they go into a coalition, the PSOE is going to collapse. It's going to become like the PASOK because they, they will be forced into a right-wing government carrying out austerity. And it's what we call in Spain the PASOKización of the PSOE. They will collapse. Um, but, but, again, if, if, but again, it's just a question of, of, in May, in the municipal elections, having local coalitions between the PP and the PSOE, which will pave the way for a big victory of Podemos in, in the general elections, which, I, as I said, are, are in November. So those are the, the perspectives. Um, uh, either a victory in November or, or in, the, for in, in the next uh, general elections after a, a, a crisis government of, of the PP and the PSOE. But anyway, I wanted to say that... Um, this phenomenon of Podemos have, has not emerged, uh, as well as Syriza, has not emerged out of the blue. 
it, it does not emerge out of a vacuum, but it is a product of a long process of, of uh, four or five years of uh, struggles by the Spanish uh, working class um, and mass mobilizations and, and, and a, a mass movement really that has learned and has developed and has evolved. Because in revolutionary situations, ordinary people, the working class, learns. It's not, uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, classes also learn and they, and they, and they draw, draw conclusions from, from their experiences. Now, uh, what, what did we see? I mean, these few, last few years have, has, have been extraordinary. The mass movements began uh, in May 2011 with, with, uh, with the Indignados movement, with, which, uh, in which millions of people spontaneously came out to the streets calling for real democracy now, for the, accusing the, 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 the parties of the system of, of not representing the people. Um, then we, we had the, the struggle by the miners uh, centered in, in Asturias and Cantabria, but that really uh, led to a massive show of solidarity. The miners marched to Madrid uh, and, they, uh, and they were welcomed by 200,000 people, I think, at 12, uh, 12 at night, in the middle of the night, 1,200,000 people welcoming the, the columns of miners. It was really impressive. Uh, and also, you had these miners were not, uh, you know, were not uh, wishy-washy uh, protesters. They had been they 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 they, they attacked the police with uh, with uh, with makeshift uh, um, rockets, and, and you know, and people still supported them because they saw that they were radical. They were fighting the government. They were fighting uh, to the death for their jobs. Then we had the movement of the of the mareas, which were uh, which are uh, movements by different public sector workers. There was, there was the, upri the popular uprising in, in Gamonal, uh, a neighborhood in, in the city of Burgos, which actually is generally deemed to be quite right-wing, but we see that right-wing cities like Burgos, like Mallorca, like Valencia have had mass movements in the past few years. Um, we saw a wave of, uh, of, of strikes in places like the Coca-Cola factories, like the local TV in Madrid, the, the cleaners in, in the city of Madrid, the Pan Rico uh, bakery in, in Catalonia. Um, there was a mass movement uh, for a, for a, after the application of the king for a republic, for a, for a referendum on the monarchy. Uh, and, and I think one of the most important mobilizations in the past few years was last year, 2014, on the 22nd of March. Uh, two, two million people on the streets of Madrid uh, in the Marcha de la Dignidad, which was a, a, a mass uh, rally calling for, um, for uh, what was it, uh, bread, uh, housing and uh, jobs and calling, this was one of the slogans of the march, to, for the economy to be put in the hands of the people. So um, I think that the, 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 what we see in this process of mass mobilizations is not just a linear, you know, one protest here, one protest there, but we see a process of, of learning and of, of maturing of the Spanish working class. It starts off with, very, with quite uh, conf confused uh, slogans like real democracy now and generally things that are concerned with politics and with democracy and, and things like that, but, but very gradually it adopts a very economic and very revolutionary type of... Uh, of um, character, the historical traditions of the Spanish working class are brought back. Like in the in the Indignados movement, there were no flags; there was, was just uh, um, you know just placards, no 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 flags, no historical chants. But now what we you see in any demonstration is that it's full of republican flags. And even if Podemos does not uh, openly stand uh, for the republic, in the rally that ha took place on Saturday on the 31st of January in Madrid, 300,000 people cheering. Uh, for uh, Pablo Iglesias and for Podemos, it was full of Republican flags. People are singing the revolutionary songs of the 1930s. Uh, on this uh, demonstration on the 22nd of March in Madrid, people were chant where the main chant was Viva la lucha de la clase obrera, long live the struggle of the working class. So you see class consciousness, you see a fight for, for revolution, for, for, for the economic transformation of, uh, of, the, of, of society. And also the most important thing is that people start to realize that it's not just a question of protesting, but that you need to take power. And you need to get organized to, to launch an assault on, on power and to take over the state. Uh, and this, I think, is what, what, led, what gave rise to Podemos. In the beginning, in the, in the Indignados movement in 2011, there was a mood of sort of anti-politics. We don't really want to get involved. We, don't, we shouldn't create a party that uh, this is united left. We shouldn't vote for them. We, yeah, there was a, a talk of abstention, of spoiling the vote. But then, gradually, people realized, no, we need to, we need to take power. And when, when, Pode when Podemos emerged, uh, through the charismatic figure of Pablo Iglesias, and they got a good result in the European elections, people latched onto this as the best way to, to take power and, and overthrow the, 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 the hated uh, PP, the PSOE, and the, and, the, and the clique of parasites they, they represent. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so this is what uh, gave rise to, to Podemos. In a context, again, of, of the deepest crisis of capitalism in the history of of, of humanity, arguably, or, or, or at least the, mo the deepest crisis since the 1930s. Uh, a crisis that has no uh, end in sight, 
the big uh, bourgeois economists that you, you, you can find this in The Economist or in the Financial Times say, talk about the secular stagnation, that is a, a century-long uh, crisis. Uh, the, <coughs> there, is, uh, the, there is complete skepticism, there is no, no way forward because it's an organic crisis of capitalism, a crisis of overproduction that was built up over years of uh, short-term avo avoidance of, of the crisis through, through an accumulation of credit, uh, which is, are now mountains of debt, uh, because we have to bear in mind that what, what is a crisis of, of capitalism? Well, capitalism is based on the exploitation of the working class. It's, it, profit is just the, the unpaid uh, surplus that is extracted for, for, from the workers by the capitalists. And as a whole, this leads to overproduction because the, the market is always too narrow for all the commodities that are produced. If you're not paying your workers enough because your profits are based on, on keeping their wages low, it means that there will be no one there to buy your products. And over a long time, in the 1990s uh, this was, and the 2000s, this was uh, overcome by giving the workers credit so they could keep buying, keep buying. Uh, and also the workers in southern Europe. Germany had a lot of overproduction, so all of her... And Germany had overproduction because from the 1980s onwards, uh, the German government had a, a, an open uh, policy of holding back wages to be competitive. So, but what did they do with, the, with that surplus that was being generated? They dumped it in uh, southern Europe, which accumulated masses of uh, debt, uh, which, uh, which has now unraveled and has led to this very deep crisis. Uh, both in Greece and Spain, you have uh, unemployment rates of over 25%. In Spain now it's a bit lower, it's 23%, but it's still extraordinarily high. Wages falling, people's conditions of living completely slashed, cuts everywhere, the, the healthcare system collapsing. Uh, in Spain, we've had 300,000 evictions in the past few years, 300,000 families taken from their houses and, and kept onto the streets. It's a complete social drama, and this has led to, to this uh, revolutionary reaction by, by, the, by the workers who are reacting against this rotten system and have realized that it has to be overthrown. Um, now, um, <clears throat> I wanted to, to talk a bit about the program of, of Podemos. Um, now, um, Podemos, in reality, is a, is a very radical party. The, the leaders of Podemos sort of uh, publicly say, well, we're neither left nor right, and, and we're not uh, revolutionaries, uh, we've got, we're Keynesians, but this is not how the ordinary person uh, in Spain sees uh, Podemos. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, this is not uh, something I'm making up or just a, 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 a vague observation, but you see this in the polls. You, you, people are asked, uh, well, how do they place Podemos politically? And according to the poll by the polls by the Spanish government, they say that it's a far left party. They have this uh, grade scale from from one to ten, one being super far left and ten being super far right. They put Podemos in uh, 2.8 percent, so a properly left wing party, uh, further left than the United Left, which is a traditional uh, coalition of the Communist Party and so on. Um, and also, uh, the, the media is constantly telling people these, are, these people are radicals, they're, they're Castroists, they're, they're, they're Chavistas, they, they're, they're in the payroll of, of the ETA, and people still uh, latch on to them because they want something radical. The, the, the reason for Podemos' uh, success is not that they have moderated and watered down their rhetoric, but on the contrary, it's because Podemos appears as a very radical party that, uh, that, um, that is going to radically transform society. Uh, this is the reason why, why Podemos is so popular, and this is the reason why Pablo Iglesias is so charismatic, not because he's watering down his program, which he, he th mostly does in when he goes to talk to The Guardian or to The Financial Times, but because he appears as a very radical uh, uh, speaker, because when he comes on TV he attacks the right-wingers and, and he completely uh, uh, throws to the ground all of their arguments, and this is why Podemos is so uh, popular. Um, uh, and, and yeah, we, we saw this, in, you, you just have to listen to his speech uh, from this weekend, it's uh, properly, uh, he's quoting Lenin actually constantly throughout the speech, uh, so, uh, so there you go, there's not that much more to say. Um, um, but, uh, and, and, and the program of Podemos is a radical program in the current situation, it's not a revolutionary program calling for the overthrow of capitalism, but it has some very radical uh, points that if implemented would have a massive uh, impact. As, as is the case with the program of uh, Syriza. Um, uh, it's calling for things like a, 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 an abolition of the, of the labor counter-reform passed by the PP government, which uh, has completely uh, destroyed the work, working conditions. Uh, it's calling for, for, um, for a reduction of the retirement age back to uh, 65 from 67. Uh, um, what else? They're calling for, uh, for, for cheaper uh, electricity and gas, for an abolition of part of the debt, uh, it's a whole series of, uh, of, of fairly radical demands that, if implemented, 
would improve the conditions of living of, of millions of people, and this is why people are, are voting for them. Uh, again, uh, people are constantly warned that, that voting for Podemos is a massive uh, danger and a massive gamble. And if people are, go are willing to take the risk, it's because they know that, that, that because they are fed up with the current situation, because they don't believe what the ruling class is telling them, and because they want a way out that is radical and that, that completely does away with the system. Because through their own experience, they have realized that they cannot do with half measures. And that the social democrats and so on, and, and, and the PP have completely betrayed them, and that the only way out is a radical program like the one Podemos is uh, proposing, and which the, the, the media and the right wing is constantly reminding them of the massive risk that it entails. But people are willing to, to take the risk. Um, and um, the only cr the critique I would have to this program, which is very good, I would add a few things, but it's a good uh, program that would, would, would improve the lives of, of, men, of millions of people. It was, I would say that the, the, what the Podemos leaders are not doing is they're not explaining how this program uh, will, be, will be carried out. Uh, where will the money come from? They vaguely say, well, we will tax the rich a bit more, we will, uh, from the abolition of the debt, we'll have a, few, a bit more money. But in reality, um, the truth is that, that there is no space in the current crisis of capitalism for, for uh, moderate Keynesian reforms. Uh, it has already been explained, Thomas and, and, and the comrade Harry already said that, uh, that we live in a, in, a, in a deep crisis of capitalism where, where it's very difficult to to, uh, to take such uh, reforms. What I would say is that this, these uh, things are all possible. You, we, can, um, we, can, we can improve wages, we can, we can get uh, subsidized electricity and gas for poor families, we can, we can give housing to the families that have been evicted, we can, uh, and we can do much more. We can reduce the retirement age much more, we can reduce the working week, we can do these things. Society, uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look around you, society has never been richer than it is today. We have more technology and more wealth accumulated than, than ever before. The problem is capitalism, and what you need to do to implement these uh, reforms is take over the commanding heights of the economy. Podemos and Syriza have to stand for the nationalization of the big banks, the big corporations, uh, and the land, and to start uh, planning the economy in the interests of the people. The wealth is there, it's just sitting idle. It's just that the company is not, not profitable for the companies to. Uh, to invest uh, into society and to, and, to, and to create jobs and so on. So the people themselves have to take over the, the, the economy. Have, they have to take power into their own hands. And this is the only way, really, in which, uh, in which uh, these programs will be, will be possible. Um, and I don't think that uh, announcing such a bold revolutionary program uh, would be an unpopular thing. As I said, Podemos is already seen as a very radical program, as a very radical part, party, sorry. And the only reason, I think, why, why people are, are still slightly hesitant about Podemos is precisely the fact that they cannot really explain how they are going to carry out their program. Uh, because they cannot, because on the current uh, reformist basis they cannot really sat satisfactorily explain how they where they will get the money and the resources to carry out these things. So they should stand up in favor of, of a bold uh, socialist program for the transformation of society. And this will become a very pressing issue very soon, because in Greece already there is a, there is a radical left-wing government um, in power. Uh, and they will, they will uh, very, oh, this is already the case, and they've, already been, they've only been in power for around 10 days. They will come under massive pressure from the capitalists to capitulate and to, and to backtrack. And this will lead to massive demoralization, and it will, it will pave the way for, for a right-wing turn in society, and, and it, will, it will create a fertile ground for, for things like the Golden Dawn in reality. Uh, they will come under massive uh, pressure to, to demoralize their, their voters. This is what the right wing is looking for, because they know that they cannot openly confront this uh, government through coup d'etat and things like that. The working class is too powerful and it's too uh, attached to the democratic gains of the past, and they will not put up with that. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to co-opt and demoralize uh, the, this, this, uh, parties and, and demoralize their, their voters. So what they need to do is launch a bold program uh, for the socialist transformation of society and call for European revolution. And I think that in, in, in Spain, definitely, we will, uh, we will be behind you. And, uh, and I, I wanted to talk a bit more about the situation in Northern Europe and in Britain, which I think uh, is also one of, uh, of deep discontent. It's only, uh, it's only a question of time that it expresses itself uh, somehow. But um, yeah, I've I'm, I'm run out of time. Thank you.